Good afternoon, Upper Sixth. So here we are, part two of bullet point seven, entrepreneurs and UK clothing retailers. Now, last video I mentioned, I was a bit nervous about the word and, and we did a, hopefully a useful video covering Gymshark and the wonderful example of a person at university with an idea, with a couple of mates probably, and uh, from pizza delivery man working for six months, um, building initial ideas in the business to what is now a multinational corporation, which is worth probably a billion quid. Now, that's a wonderful big business story. We need to understand that most entrepreneurs in the UK, let alone in the clothing sector, aren't of the standing and size as Gymshark. It could be, for example, two brothers um, who decide to set up a business selling their own designs, t-shirts, things like that, and they've called it Rapa Nui. Um, and, you know, they're really interested in the environment. They're interested in sustainable fashion, as we can see by the picture. Um, and they're, they're trying to talk about traceability and just-in-time production methods and all of those sorts of things. The reason I've chosen these guys is because they also support other business startups. So if I want to print a small run of t-shirts, maybe 20, um, I can send over the design to these guys and they will make them probably within 48 hours and ship them out to me. There's a minimum order of 60 quid. Now, if I just want to dip my toe into the market, think about that um, product life cycle, my R&D stage, um, I don't want to possibly commit everything to my business venture at the moment. I might need my day job, delivering pizzas possibly, um, to start my business off. So I can actually send it over to these guys. They can talk to me about traceability. They can talk to me about environmental, um, environmentally friendly um, textiles, for example. So maybe this adds value to my brand and I can put this in the blurb about my t-shirts. So not only um, am I dropping seeds, not bombs, this is their design, don't try and copy it, um, but also I can talk about the environmentally friendly element of my design. I just out outsource the um, sourcing of the cotton and the t-shirts and the sweat tops to these guys and they will get them from their supply chain. Okay, so it's a low risk way in some ways of me tr testing the marketplace. These guys will help with that, but they're a tiny business, absolutely tiny. I haven't gone into their accounts, but uh, we can sort of tell that from their website. Okay, so in the blurb from um, Mr. Marcuse, um, he did a case study on hookandeye.com. Now, Probably for the same reasons, actually. I've decided to go with these guys instead, but it's actually a really good case study, so it's worth mentioning. Um, so hookandeye.com, I won't put it up on, on the slides, but they are a manufacturer of clothing. Now, if you look at the people who they work with and they list some of the fashion clients they have, they're clearly people that have just got an idea and they want to run with it. I clicked on a couple of the hyperlinks of the people they say they work with um, and a couple of them, the websites don't work. A couple of them go to Wix.com, as in the free website provider. Um, it was a blank page because clearly they don't have a website anymore. Um, there was one that went straight through to an Instagram page, so they didn't have a corporate face as such. Perfect for a small company. This is how lots of small companies start off. And there was two of them. Um, that then went to something that looked like a bit more of a corporate website. I'm thinking that they're doing a bit better. And there's one of them that was offering to sell me things in US dollars. So maybe they still get it made, the, pro the products made by Hook and I, or maybe they've moved on to other providers over the other side of the pond. Okay, so we can see how sometimes these smaller manufacturers that are willing to work with the more niche business startups, you know, this is where the entrepreneurial side of it is. So we're thinking about entrepreneurial supply chains here, as well as the entrepreneurial brands like uh, Rapa Nui, for example. Okay, so we'll move on. So here's a case study that I, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, sort of made up based on a couple of case studies on Rapa Nui that I found online. At this point, you can pause and you can read. OK, you won't find this online because I've, as I say, I've taken a couple and merged it into one. Look for the examples of entrepreneurship, moving from entrepreneurs to leaders, the motives, the barriers to entrepreneurship. How, how do they demonstrate things like resilience, spotting a gap in the market, for example, self-confidence, being persuasive? Have a look for all of those. Pause the video. Did you pause the video? I don't think so. Um, so let's move on. We'll do this the same as we did with Gymshark. So we're looking for evidence from the case study. I'm not going to quote all of it. I've quoted a couple. Um, so if you think about it, they created the business. The two brothers had an idea to create a sustainable fashion brand. They were thinking about environmental issues and they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to use natural materials, renewable energy, and they wanted to design products that could be reused or remade into something else. Quite important, okay, to them. And very trendy at the moment, yeah. So, you know, we talked about Gymshark, how they are using, you know, plastic bottles. If you look into that industry at the moment with plastic bottles, there is a massive global shortage of used plastic bottles. Believe it or not, they're very cheap to buy brand new. Um, I wonder how many companies are literally buying them brand new because the price of used plastic bottles has actually increased. Not quite what we're trying to do with saving the planet, though, is it? But it looks very good that our clothes are made from plastic bottles. Anyway, not this company. These are too ethical, these guys, by the looks of it. So running and expanding. So we're looking for evidence of them running and expanding. They're expanding not so much by gobbling up market share and trying to dominate the world. Yeah, let's avoid using the word dominate. Um, or monopolize or something like that. So what we're looking for here is how are they going to grow this business? Well, they've decided to grow by sharing technology with others. Um, they've decided to work with other entrepreneurs in the fashion industry to help them become more sustainable. You know, they want to be part of this bigger movement as such, which is a lovely thing. You know, these guys are very much into profit satisficing okay you need to know that definition because not all entrepreneurs want to take over the world not all entrepreneurs have the ambition or are brave enough to try and do what Gymshark are doing okay that you know there are lots of entrepreneurs out there that um, don't make it there's a huge amount in the fashion industry um, that really want to be the next Gymshark and they try it. They don't have the capital. They don't have the right idea maybe for the marketplace. Maybe they're too early. Who knows? Not all entrepreneurs are the same. We're looking for the entrepreneurship. So that entrepreneurial skill, the innovation within a business. Well, they are interested in introducing this traceability system and their T-mill platform. Um, so, you know, this is a great example of that innovation with inside of the business. This is sort of their little bit of a USP in some ways. Traceability is not a USP. But bragging about traceability when you're in competition with fast fashion, maybe that differentiates your brand. OK, maybe people will be willing to spend a little bit more money if they know exactly where things have come from. Okay, look at the Hotel Chocolat example where they own their own um, cocoa plantations. They own their own refineries. They, you know, they own a hotel, funnily enough. Um, so if you think about it, the story behind their own cocoa plantation. Now, these guys are running a small shop, um, helping other, uh, other small businesses and people that just want to print their own T-shirts. They're not going to be going out and buying themselves a cotton plantation um, and all the other stuff in between in, in the supply chain. But talking about traceability has been really common in food for years, 
since horse meat scandals with Tesco's and other supermarkets. So why not with this? The Cotton Alliance that we see on Primark's clothes. Does that really mean anything to people? Are we just sensitive? Are we just sorry numb to this? Yeah, we've got fair trade on the window of um, of um, Rapa Nui's win uh, uh, shop. But does that really inspire me to go in and say, yes, this is fair trade cotton. I must buy it. Or actually, the narrative behind the traceability, is that something else that our young entrepreneurs could actually push to make them stand out in the marketplace? And remember, their aims are to spread the message, to, you know, to support the broader ecosystem of sustainable fashion. So, barriers to entrepreneurship, money. Okay, it's really expensive. They own a shop, or they probably rent it, by the way. Um, they've had to buy computer equipment and T-shirt printers. Um, they want to use renewable energy. I've bored you with stories in class of my solar panels and how I thought it was going to be a 25-year return on investment. It wasn't, but that's not the point. I start to pay for them in advance. Now, these guys want to be more environmentally friendly. That might mean that they're at a cost advantage against people that don't really care that much about the environment. It is cheaper for me to order purpose-made, bespoke-made, sorry, T-shirts, probably from India, than it would be from these guys. I'll have to wait a bit longer for them, probably. Um, but I can soon get someone in Bangladesh to very quickly knock me up some T-shirts. I'm sure they've got a website. We're thinking about risk. Now, these guys have addressed that risk because they sort of make to order. They can make in small batches. So in some ways, if consumer trends shift, they're not going to be stuck with a load of stock. Quite a lot of their T-shirts will be plain white T-shirts and then they'll put them in a machine and it'll suddenly print stuff on the front of them. Um, however, if the market shifts away from environmentally friendly T-shirts, for example, um, they have a shop, they have rent, they probably want a wage to be able to pay their mortgages and their bills. So even though I've mentioned profit satisficing, it doesn't mean they can just survive in no, no matter what. So we have to think about that they are still vulnerable to uncertainties in the marketplace. If there's an economic downturn and people just want cheap t-shirts, they might stop buying them from them. So if we're thinking about other motives, clearly I like that t-shirt. Um, entrepreneurial motives and characteristics. Remember motives could be linked into motivational um, theory as well, depending on the question. Make sure you don't go off on a mad rant about motivational theory. So we're looking at those characteristics that are required and we can see that from the from the case study, they've got vision, they're adaptable, problem solving, they're resilient, they're willing to take risks with their own capital. There's two brothers from the same family. I think, you know, in, in lots of ways, both of them are willing to take this risk together, which is quite nice. Yeah, but they definitely demonstrate some of those characteristics. We're thinking about those motives, why people set up business and, and you know, this for lots of different reasons. Financial, non-financial links into the motivation theory again. But if we're thinking about this, I've mentioned profit satisficing. It's definitely about this company. Look in the case study. Look for the real motives. Don't just presume that everyone wants to take over the world and become rich on a yacht. Even though with British weather at the moment, quite like the idea of that in the Caribbean. However, non-financial motives, this case study screams it. Yeah, they want to work towards a world without waste. Um, you know, and it's beyond the financial success, even though they need enough money to pay the bills and to live. OK, now, if they suddenly start making a lot of money from this, I'm sure they won't complain. However. Profit satisficing, you will know people in your social or family networks that have had a very successful professional career. They get to about 55 and they say, do you know what? I don't want to work 80 hours a week anymore. I'm going to work three days a week, 
maybe from home. And for the rest of the week, I'm going to play golf or spend time in the garden or whatever they're going to do. Now, they still have that professional life, but other things become more important. These guys, well, they're not quite to that stage in their life by the looks of their pictures, um, photos, sorry, but actually they're focusing on other things that are more important. Get yourself on social media, talk about environmental impact, encourage others to manufacture clothes in a more environmental way. Just-in-time production methods will minimise waste, for example. It's not only a sensible thing because you're keeping up with demands in the marketplace. It is a way to reduce waste. Why make a year's worth of clothes for a trend and then get stuck with stuff? And then do what some of the luxury brands do and just set fire to it. Not very good for the environment. Um, however, we understand economies of scale. And if these guys suddenly have to you know, print individual T-shirts and they want to make a thousand of them, um, then they're probably, you know, they're going to be swearing about those printers. They don't look very quick. So there's going to be a certain amount of capacity utilisation here. And where is the tipping point before they go a little bit more mass production? Not sure. How ethical will they be if suddenly lots of people are dangling lots and lots of money in front of them? I don't know. I think I think my my inner child, my naive child hopes that they're really in it for the planet. I really hope so. So here are here are the I was about to say lads, it's a bit condescending. Um, but we've got fair trade in the window. Love this. Um, we've got fresh ground coffee. There's another reason to uh, come in, maybe for a cup of coffee. Um, there's a furniture shop in the village where I live. Um, they clearly can't sell enough furniture, so they opened up a cafe. Uh, they sort of come, you know, they help with revenue and they help bring people in as well. Um, you see a lot of this type of thing. So moving from entrepreneur to leader, um, we've got two people that run a business together. Uh, I didn't see anything on their website about uh, a social media team, a HR department, a finance department. I haven't looked at their company accounts. My gut feeling is this is actually a very, very small business. Might be wrong. Um, so they're thinking about, they've thought about starting up. They want this they're leading their own business. Maybe they're motivating each other. They're leaders in their own right, aren't they? But at this stage, we're not really talking about leading to do with their business. I think the aims, reading the article and what's on their website and about the interviews they've had, is about influencing and leading others in the industry, trying to make a difference with environmentalism. It's a different type of leadership. It's being that inspiration to others, which might be um, where the leadership characteristics come in here, where before they were interested in starting up a business being environmentally friendly. Now they're hoping to lead and influence others. Risks of overtrading, I've sort of already mentioned it in context with these guys. Um, this is one of my predictions, but uh, one of many for the exam paper. Um, Really, with these guys, because it's such small batches, they're using batch production, maybe even just one or two at a time. They're, you know, it's very much just in time. So, yes, they have blank t shirts. I'm sure they've got some of those in stock. And then they will print to order small batches. I upload my design, they print it for me, they ship it to me. So, in lots of ways, the risks of overtrading are minimized because they will have generic blank stock as in this t-shirt would have come through as just white, for example, um, and they will have this stuck on a shelf. And then if you want to put this graphic on there, they'll just print it for you. Okay, so in some ways, generic stock can be individualized. So that individualization in the more niche areas of fashion is probably a, a good example um, of these guys as well at Rapa Nui. Difficulties in developing, well, you know, the sort of there's two of them. So if you're having a bad day, then it's quite difficult to motivate a couple. It's a very small team by the sounds of it. There might be others that work with them. I apologise, lads, if if you've got a, a huge team, and you know, there's two brothers as well. 
you know anyone who's ever worked in a small family company there's there's some really up, good upsides to it um, and actually you then go home at night and you're still in the same unit as you were at work sometimes having that separation so the difficulties of developing from entrepreneur to leader it might be that these guys have a slightly different vision they might want to go in their separate um, directions on certain things don't really know uh, not a, not enough information there but if you're thinking about it from the perspective of I need to run the business to make some profit for my profit satisficing and then maybe you're then trying to achieve your other leadership aims of leading and inspiring others you still need to be able to generate enough cash and profits to run your business or you won't be able to achieve so that's maybe where the difficulties are maybe there's only two of them maybe they've got limited time and how much time can they have to develop and achieve their leadership aims so some conclusions overall um well there's huge amounts of entrepreneurs because lots of people look at things like super dry for example and let's face it super dry all they do is shove their name on a t-shirt um, as do lots of other uh, companies as well. So clearly lots of people think if they just stick their name on a T-shirt and do some social media that might influence people, that they're suddenly going to be the next Gymshark. Don't think it's quite that easy or everyone would be doing it. But there's, there is a lot of organisations that go out of business very, very quickly. Yeah. So finding that niche to make you stand out in a marketplace, if it's too niche, you're probably not going to be able to make a living out of it. If you're too mass, who are you going into competition with? So you need that differentiation factor. And is that sustainability? Well, it sounds like that's not so much of a niche anymore. Yeah, so this is a growing niche. And when the multinationals are all over it, then we become numb to it. Look at Rainforest Alliance Coffee, for example. It was a really big thing for a while. Now, we just expect it. And if it wasn't on the wall when I walk into Starbucks, I probably wouldn't care, to be honest with you. Whereas I might have when there was lots of press around it. Look at Fair Trade Chocolate. Yeah, it's we're so numb to that. Nestle just invented their own Fair Trade brand. Consumers of Nestle chocolate are none the wiser um, and maybe they don't care because they just want to eat their chocolate and there's a little badge on there that says that it's friendly. OK, so we need we need to think about how these things change with social trends. And also, if everyone's doing it, there's no differentiation. So what can you do to differentiate? OK, so but yeah. There are some success stories in there, and I mentioned the, the, super, the super dry version as well. Um, they started off on the market stall, and we know that, uh, obviously, from the previous one. So, it's exam time. So here's some questions for each one. I'm not going to go through all of them. You decide if it's an 8, 10 or 12 marker. There's a slightly different technique for all of them. So identify the hook in the question, identify the knowledge that needs to be defined in context. And then from the case studies that I've given you in the previous video and this video, pop in, get yourself some evidence and at least plan some of these. It's up to you if you if you write them, if you write them. And obviously, if you're my students, um, I'm more than happy to mark them for you. And we'll go through them either in clinic time or you have a link to my diary. You can book yourself an appointment and we'll do some one to one in the build up to the exam. Loads of time to do that. We've got weeks and weeks. So. Entrepreneur. Uh, motives characteristics there's, there's you've you've got a number there and you'll notice from the language in the questions likely impact likely limitations that's an eight marker probably um and you know likely benefits that could be an eight marker or a ten marker um so think about how you want to do this okay there's some we there's some nice questions there repeated it again for Rapa Nui for you um and same sort of thing, slightly different uh, perspective because of the size and scope 
of the business. They talk about this circular economy. I've put quotation marks around it. I don't want you to think of this as the circular flow of income. That's not what we're talking about here. They call it the circular economy. And it's a well, it's a well um, used term in industry. And but from their perspective, it's, it's that leadership stuff. It's it's they want to get out there with a message and influence people. It's not just about selling T-shirts. Yeah. Profit satisficing. Hopefully that was nice and useful for you. And uh, thank you for your time. There's one more bullet to do after this, which is on the tiny, tiny um, bullet of distribution methods. Um, those of you that have um, met Miss Bristow's husband, you should collar him, really. Uh, he works with lots of people in fashion and uh, because of the company he probably works for. I won't mention them depending on who else is listening to this video. Have a good day.